It's no surprise that newsmakers try to manipulate the audience. They want you to believe that they are the one holding the line and they'll use any trick they can to get you there. But don't let them fool you. Get unspun. I'm Amanda Sturgill. I've been a reporter, and today I teach future reporters to cut the spin and think critically about what newsmakers say. My podcast, Unspun, shows you how to know when you're being manipulated by the news. Learn to spot the tricks and how to make up your own mind about what's true. So if you're tired of being fooled by the news, subscribe to Unspun today. Unspun, because you deserve the truth. Hi, I'm Liz Winstead. I'm Moji Alawode Al. And we're the hosts of Feminist Buzzkills, the only weekly podcast that helps you navigate the post row hellscape. We dissect all the news from that sketchy intersection of abortion and misogyny with our guests, the abortion providers and activists working on the ground. Plus, we have amazing comedians to help us laugh through the rage. Feminist Buzzkills drops Fridays wherever you get your pod fix. Listen and subscribe, because when BS is popping, we pop off. M-S-W Media. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Thursday, October 5th, 2023. Today, Rudy Giuliani is suing Joe Biden for defamation after a second lawyer dumps him from his Fulton County case. Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer have been kicked out of their Capitol hideaway offices. President Biden has canceled another $9 billion in student loan debt. Democrats and veterans call for urgent approval of Ukraine aid as funds dwindle. And a lawsuit against the disinformation propaganda movie 2000 Mules will be allowed to go forward. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hey, Dana. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday to you, my friend. We are getting through the week. Where are you in the country these days? I am up in P-Town for uh, a little bit of, not really vacay, because obviously I'm working today, but just to get out of um, get out of the towns that I that I then am often in. So yeah, that's where I'm at. Uh, next week is Women's Week at P-Town, so a lot of my colleagues are going to be performing, um, and I'll be here just sort of walking the streets and supporting them this time. I don't have any gigs. It's kind of nice. I love that. Sometimes, you know, you just you want to just go and enjoy some comedy instead of having to make it. <laughs> it's totally true. <laughs> yeah, that's why I like listening to other people's podcasts. I'm down with OPP, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm home. I'm back in uh, Southern California. Glad to be here. My cats are very uh, happy that I'm home. Also very angry that I left. Uh, they'll get over it soon. But I had a wonderful time. And one of our stories uh, this week is covering what I went to Washington, D.C. to do. So I can't wait to get to that story. Also, after the ouster of Kevin McCarthy as speaker, the speaker pro tem, Patrick McHenry, announced that he was going to kick Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer out of their Capitol hideaway offices. Now, the hideaways are a little small suites conveniently located in the Capitol itself, close to votes on the House floor and, you know, where all the action is. But new reporting from Jamie Gangel at CNN reveals it was actually Kevin McCarthy who told Patrick McHenry to kick them out. And next week, guess who's moving in to Pelosi's old office? Oh, boy. Hmm. Kevin McCarthy. Just. Yep. Just petty bitches. All of them. You know, on 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 Wednesdays, we wear pink, I guess. That's what's happening in the House with the Republicans. So. We have a lot of news to get to besides that, but I, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that that like what else can they possibly pull off in their little weird mean girls, real house Republicans of D.C. County, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, it's just so childish. Like, they are. They're petty children. They are. Good dickheads. Anyway, uh, we have a lot of news to get to. So let's do it. Let's hit the hot notes. Awesome. Hot notes. First up, from Zachary Cohen at CNN, former New York City mayor Rudy Giuliani filed a defamation lawsuit Wednesday against President Joe Biden (laughs) because Biden called him a Russian pawn during a presidential debate nearly three years ago. Giuliani announced the lawsuit at a rambling and sparsely attended news conference. Uh, It wasn't at Four Seasons Landscaping, but it was outside a courthouse in New Hampshire where he filed to take advantage of the state's defamation laws. 
The former mayor reiterated several familiar attacks against Biden and his son, Hunter, though he only sued the president, despite the high bar for statements by public figures in a political setting to be found defamatory. The move comes as Giuliani is facing his own legal exposure on several fronts and new questions about his ability to pay his own lawyers. Wednesday's news conference took place shortly after news broke that another lawyer who's been representing Giuliani in the Georgia election subversion case has also withdrawn as counsel (laughs) and asked if he was concerned about Giuliani's ability to pay his legal fees in this case as his debts mount. Lou Diamond, one of the attorneys who appeared Wednesday alongside the former New York mayor, told reporters, that is the furthest thing from my mind. Yeah, it won't be Lou next year when he owes you $1.5 million and hasn't paid you. Quote, when I say he's my friend, he's my friend, and he's a friend of the country. He's America's mayor. That's what Diamond said. Okay. CNN has reached out to the White House for comment, but there isn't any. Giuliani also addressed reporting from the New York Times that prosecutors from special counsel Jack Smith's office have asked about the former mayor's drinking habits and what Donald Trump knew about it while Giuliani served as the former president's lawyer. Trump uh, has been indicted, as we know, in Jack Smith's federal election interference case. You can get all that information, plus everything else Jack Smith is doing on the Jack podcast with me and Andy McCabe. And CNN previously reported that Giuliani is listed as a co-conspirator. He's actually co-conspirator one in that case that Jack Smith brought in D.C. Giuliani has not been charged with a crime in that case yet. Quote, if I had an alcohol problem and I could do all of that, I should be in the Guinness Book of Records. It's funny that he quotes the Guinness Book of Records when he's talking about his alcohol problems. (laughs) Guinness is the beer. Giuliani said (laughs) at the news conference in New Hampshire, where he listed off his accomplishments as a former federal prosecutor and mayor, I do not have an alcohol problem. I have never had an alcohol problem. I can always get it. So there's no problem. No, he didn't say that last part. I just added it. At the center of Giuliani's new lawsuit are comments made by then-candidate Joe Biden during a presidential debate in Nashville in late 2020. At the time, Biden said Russia was feeding Giuliani false information to help Trump's chances of getting elected president. Uh, Good luck proving that false. Quote, they're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Russian President Vladimir Putin about it. That's what Biden said at the time, referring to Moscow's efforts to undermine the U.S. electoral process. Quote, his own national security advisor told him that what is happening with his buddy, well, I shouldn't. Well, I will. His buddy, Rudy Giuliani. He's being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian. That's not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that everything's going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president of the United States because they know I know them and they know me. Now, Giuliani said Wednesday he has been personally harmed by Biden's comments. (laughs) Yeah, that's why. That's why your life sucks. Because three years ago, he said you were getting... Oh, my God. Getting fed, fed Russian propaganda. Uh, in 2021, the U.S. intelligence community assessed that Putin, quote, had purview over the activities of Andrei Durkach. That's a Kremlin-linked former Ukrainian lawmaker who met with Giuliani and repeatedly promoted anti-Biden disinformation. Giuliani also insisted that the lawsuit was not in retaliation for a lawsuit previously filed by Hunter Biden against Rudy and his former attorney, Robert Costello, who's now suing him for $1.4 million, that asserted they violated federal and state computer privacy laws through their alleged efforts to hack his devices. Thank you, AG. This next story is from Nikki Carvajal. The Biden administration has approved debt relief for an additional 125,000 student loan borrowers. That's totaling $9 billion in forgiveness. This is from the White House. That's what we heard on Wednesday. The announcement comes just days after the federal student loan payments restarted after a three-plus year pause. Now, though the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's hallmark student loan forgiveness program, which promised up to $20,000 in debt relief for low and middle income borrowers, very specific, by the way, the administration has continued to find other ways to provide debt relief, which has been beautiful. The cancellations announced Wednesday came through three different existing debt relief programs that have been plagued with problems from the past. The White House is conducting what it's calling fixes to a broken student loan system. An additional 53,000 borrowers will receive debt cancellation under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which wipes away remaining student loan debt after qualifying public sector workers make 10 years worth of monthly payments. 10 years and it's still not paid off. Nearly 51,000 borrowers who have been in repayment for at least 20 years 
are getting relief thanks to a recount of their past payments. And the administration has found that these borrowers already qualified for student loan forgiveness, but were missing out because of past administrative errors. <laughs> administrative errors. Sorry, this is funny. And nearly 22,000 borrowers who have a total or permanent disability have now been approved for an automatic debt relief discharge through a data match with the Social Security Administration. Biden, who made a campaign pledge to cancel some student loan debt, he spoke about his administration's recent efforts on Wednesday. His remarks were in part an effort by the White House to draw a contrast between the Republican-driven chaos in Capitol Hill, well, where Republican Kevin McCarthy was just ousted as the House Speaker Tuesday. So that's going real well for them. Um, This is a quote. This kind of relief is life-changing for individuals and their families, but it's good for our economy as well. By freeing millions of Americans from the crushing burden of student debt, it means they can go and get their lives in order. That's from our dear president. And went on to say they can think about buying a house. They can start a business. They can be starting a family. This matters. It matters to their daily lives. Now, a White House official said that the new discharges bring the total approved debt cancellation to $127 billion for nearly 3.6 million borrowers so far during Biden's time in office. This is huge. Yeah, massive. Absolutely massive. And I'm so glad he's doing this. So thank you. uh, Thanks to our president. All right. From Svetlana Shkolinikova at Stars and Stripes, Democrats in the Senate and House joined veterans and former military leaders Tuesday to urge Congress to approve immediate aid for Ukraine as funds available for the country's defense against Russia's invasion dwindle. This is the event I was at. The calls for action followed a decision by Congress on Saturday to pass a stopgap funding bill that omitted Ukraine aid in order to win enough Republican support to avoid shutdown. Some Democrats said it's vital to correct that omission. Quote, Ukraine is not just fighting for their territorial integrity. It's not just fighting for their democracy. Ukraine is fighting for our democracy as well. That's Representative Jake Auchincloss from Massachusetts, a Democrat and also a Marine veteran. He went on to say they're not asking for American troops to fight there. They're asking for Americans to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. The White House asked Congress in August to approve $24 billion in aid, including $13 billion in military assistance. The money was expected to be included in the short-term spending agreement to keep the government open, but was stripped away by Republicans in the House. Senator Richard Blumenthal pointed out that aid to Ukraine makes up less than 5% of the defense budget. Less than 5%. That's crazy. To defend democracy. Yeah. What are we, what's the defense budget for, if not for defending democracy here and abroad? Quote, all this talk about how, oh, we ought to be spending it on the border. We ought to be spending it on our needs. We can do both, Blumenthal said. That, that's what a great country does. We keep our word. We do what's necessary at home and we stop appeasement. We do not appease. Congress has approved $113 billion in military, economic, and humanitarian assistance for Ukraine since Russia's full-scale invasion in February of 2022. That's according to the Congressional Research Service. The Defense Department's top budgetary official warned congressional leaders this week that the Pentagon only has about $1.6 billion left from a previous $26 billion assistance package to replace weapons and equipment shipped to Ukraine, to replace our weapons and equipment. The Pentagon still has $5.4 billion available to pull weapons from its own stocks, but money for the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, that's a program that purchases weapons for Ukraine, has completely dried up. That's Pentagon Comptroller Michael McCord. He said Ukraine urgently needs air defense weapons and ammunition as Russia prepares a winter offensive. Quote, we have enough funding authorities to meet Ukraine's battlefield needs for just a little longer. That's Sabrina Singh, the Pentagon's deputy press secretary. But we need Congress to act to ensure there's no disruption in our support, especially as the department seeks to replenish our stocks. Russia said Monday that the delay in funding is a harbinger of rising weariness among Western nations to continue supporting Ukraine. Quote, fatigue from this conflict, fatigue from the completely absurd sponsorship of the Kiev regime will grow in various countries, including the United States. That's Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov. This fatigue will lead to the fragmentation of the political establishment and the growth of contradictions. Now that right there, that is pure Russia propaganda. So Mm -hmm. ignore that dickhead. Stephen Anderson, a retired brigadier general, now working with the veterans group Vote Vets, said the U.S. spent $300 million per day, per day, on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
And Ukraine is a far more important fight, he says. Every dollar we've sent to Ukraine has been a good dollar spent. That was Auchincloss. That's the representative former Marine. He went on to say, we have cratered half of Russia's conventional military capacity, doubled their border with NATO, induced our allies to spend more on their own defense, and sent a stark message to the dictator, both in the Kremlin and in Beijing, that America is not going anywhere. So excellent press conference. I want to thank everybody who showed up, the three uh, members of Congress, the three senators, of course, retired Colonel Eugene Vindman. It, it was uh, it was an excellent presentation. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, AJ. Truly, I'm sure all the listeners second this, third it, fourth it, fifth it. Thank you for everything you do as well. Thanks. You know, you've went through a lot of shit with the last administration and for you to still you know, have the fire to get up and, and go now that you're, you know, we're under someone that we actually believe in and want to support. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. This was from Philip Bump at the Post. Now, when identifying the individuals most responsible for convincing supporters of Donald Trump that the 2020 election was stolen, no one surpasses Trump himself. But one could argue that the second person on the list is filmmaker and right-wing douchebag and activist, is what they're calling him, Dinesh D'Souza, whose 2022 film, 2000 Mules, reinvigorated unsubstantiated allegations, unsubstantiated, about voter fraud and earned him an enormous sum of money in the process. D'Souza's fraud allegations were adapted from a group called True the Vote, which has been in the, quote, election protection industry for some time. <laughs> Yeah, and you can't see AG's face, but both of us are like, whatever. The film alleges that cell phone geolocation data allowed True the Vote to identify a ring of people who collected and submitted ballots. The film doesn't show the data, however, except for one map depicting a purported ballot mule, if this is what they're calling it, near Atlanta. Now, instead, it relies on publicly available surveillance footage captured at ballot boxes and ballot drop boxes, which DeSouza claimed in the movie, by the way, and in an interview with The Washington Post, depicted solely those who'd been identified as mules who visited numerous drop boxes. Well, there is literally no reason to believe any of this, okay? None. No one has ever been identified as part of such ring, despite the purported, quote, evidence that he's trying to put forth in the movie and in every press conference he's ever done. Now, the surveillance footage never actually shows anyone going to more than one drop box to deposit a ballot, ever. In fact, only rarely does it show anyone depositing more than one ballot. Now, the map of a mule uh, that it shows was fake, okay? Completely made up. As True Votes' Greg Phillips actually admitted in an email to the Post, the geolocation data used for the True Votes' alleged analysis was not sufficiently precise to identify a visit uh, to someone as discreetly located as a, a ballot drop box, even if they knew where a location the drop boxes were at. Now, True the Vote has declined to share its data publicly or make it uh, alleged whistleblowers known to authorities, of course, and this is sort of triggering a state-level con condemnation of their work. Like, everyone's against it. Now, that's just the technical side. DeSouza made other claims, like that he has estimates of how many ballots were being deposited on average, something he says he could determine from video analysis, which is also bullshit. It's, it's nonsense. But it was an important number because it let him present a purported scale of fraud sufficient to show that Joe Biden didn't actually win in 2020. That's precisely the argument that his market was craving. All of this is still... It has currency. Now, despite repeated robust debunking of the film's claims, Trump supporters continued to point to it as a valid piece of work. Trump himself did so as recently as last month, telling NBC News' Kristen Welker that there's so much proof of fraud, including 2,000 mules. So he, he actually uses the movie and of all the ballot stuffing that's on tape which they have no proof of. Now, one reason this all continues to ferment is that there has been no accountability for DeSouza or True the Vote. DeSouza's already shaky credibility is evaporated outside of the right-wing media, and True the Vote never had much in the first place. <laughs> and now, Phillips' insistence, by the way, in November 2016 that he had evidence of millions of fraudulent votes in that election was never validated. Okay, so this has been a problem for a long fucking time now. Elsewhere... Claims about fraud have been curtailed in the face of legal challenges like, of course, the Dominion voting system suits against right-wing media outlets. So far, DeSouza has avoided that fate, but that may be about to change. 
On Monday, U.S. District Judge Stephen Grimberg, he allowed a lawsuit against DeSouza and True the Vote to move forward, a suit that might impose some penalty, at least, on the filmmaker for his false presentations. At issue in this is the film's inclusion of footage, okay, showing a man named Mark Andrews depositing multiple ballots into a ballot box. And we had covered this at one point. This wasn't fraud, as the state investigation determined. It was submitting ballots for himself and his family. Andrews claimed that he'd received threats as a result of the claims made in the film and the media appearances. Last year, he actually sued for defamation. So Greenberg also noted that DeSouza's companion book, and this has been pulled from shelves at one point to remove false claims, it used a still, just a still of Andrews positing those ballots into the boxes with a caption under this photo describing it as organized crime. Now, the book was published after Andrews' counsel informed defendants that their portrayal of Andrews was false. This is from the Judge Grimberg. Now, the state is set for a ruling against DeSouza and True the Vote, though it isn't a certainty. With the suit moving forward, it also means that we might get new evidence that the central conceit of the movie, that the geolocation, that data pointed to mules who were then caught on tape, is false, which is the premise of the whole thing. Now, Andrew's case may yield a judgment in favor of Andrew's to his benefit. It may also others wary about citing the movie as a credible presentation of alleged voter fraud in 2020, but it might go further than that. It might demonstrate that there is no connection between the video footage and the purported geolocation data, which the lack of footage of people visiting multiple drop boxes would suggest. And if there's no geolocation data tied to the video presentation, then 2,000 Mules falls apart immediately and completely because that is the premise of their movie, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So this is a um, lawsuit. It's going forward. It's been being allowed to go forward. So I I'm pretty sure Andrews will win this case against DeSouza. So we'll see what he ends up having to pay him. I love it. All he's right. such a POS. I mean, yeah, beyond. he's just an example of just one of the millions of lying dickheads that are trying to make up the story that there's voter fraud and that there's that, you know, it's why. So I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. We'll keep a yeah. keep an eye on it for you. All right. We have a lot of good news to get to, but we have to take a quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. It's no surprise that newsmakers try to manipulate the audience. They want you to believe that they are the one holding the line and they'll use any trick they can to get you there. But don't let them fool you. Get unspun. I'm Amanda Sturgill. I've been a reporter, and today I teach future reporters to cut the spin and think critically about what newsmakers say. My podcast, Unspun, shows you how to know when you're being manipulated by the news. Learn to spot the tricks and how to make up your own mind about what's true. So if you're tired of being fooled by the news, subscribe to Unspun today. Unspun because you deserve the truth. Hi, I'm Moji Alawodeyal from the Feminist Buzzkills Live Pod, the only podcast that helps you navigate the news in this post-pro anti-abortion hellscape. Each week with co-hosts Marie Kahn and Liz Winstead, we dissect all the news from that sketchy intersection of abortion and misogyny with providers and activists working on the ground. The cherry on top is we have amazing comedy guests who help us laugh through the rage. Feminist Buzz Kills Live drops Fridays wherever you pod. Listen and subscribe, because when BS is popping, we pop off. The issues of the day are really complicated. Everybody loves a good hot take, but really understanding an issue takes some digging. I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent and I'm a legal and national security analyst. And I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down to a soundbite or a tweet. Join us each week as we dig deep into pressing legal topics. Listen to It's Complicated anywhere you get your podcasts and check out our YouTube channel. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Good news, everyone. Then good news, everyone. Na, 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 
here. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, if you want to give a shout out to your business or a local business in your area or a loved one or yourself, uh, if you have some sh shit kids say or shit you say or shit your parents say, um, if you want to send in uh, baby pictures, frog orgies, whoopee stories, blanky stories, stuffed animal stories, play what the mutt or find the cat or what the heck wine where I guess what kind of horse you have, whatever you want to send to us, you can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. All right, Dana, first up from Terry, pronouns she and her. I'm a listener from the kitchen days and appreciate your honest and fearless reporting. Just a quick correction to note that Rep Carvajal, my rep's first name, is pronounced Salud. Thank you again for keeping us sane in the insane MAGA circus. Terry, thank you very much. Absolutely. We do always love the corrections, especially when they're very clear. <laughs> All right, this one's from Anonymous. Pronouns on this one are he and him. Recently, my, oh, recently my sister passed away in August of this year at age 71. And since she could never talk about what she would like done upon her passing, I was left with making those decisions. She left very few assets, so I arranged the cremation and told myself that something would come to me regarding the disposition of her cremains. Now, it was your show that gave me my inspiration. Shortly before she died, she booked a cruise with some of her friends of over 50 years to Cabo San Lucas. My sister never traveled without a doll that our mother made for her many years ago. It was her whoopee. After learning that the cruise line will allow scattering of cremains at sea without charge, my wife and I got booking on that cruise and planned to take my sister, the doll, and the cremains of three of her dogs that she loved on the cruise that she planned. She'll take one more trip with her whoopee. Oh, Anonymous, this is such a sweet story. Mm. And there it is. Look at it. It's beautiful. What a wonderful mm. idea. Thank you, Anonymous. All right, next up, Graham of Seven. Pronouns she and her. I was listening yesterday's episode when I heard of a first-time grandma asking for suggestions for her grandma name. As the grandmother of seven, I too wanted a name that sounded hip and not old. <laughs> I went with Graham, and I love it. Yes. I'm attaching a recent snapshot of my magnificent seven. You may recognize the youngest as I recently sent her photo to you. Remember the roles? Oh, oh yes, yeah. I do. Anyway, congratulations to the new grandma. Being a grandparent is simply the best. Look at the magnificent seven here. My gosh. Amazing. And that little Michelin baby is so freaking cute. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful family, Graham. Thank you, Graham. I appreciate that. I, I like Graham. I do. I love it. All right. This one's also from Anonymous. Pronouns on this one are she and her, though. Hello, lovely ladies who bring joy to so many, along with all the news, both good and bad. I hate to correct people, but I'm a lifelong Michigander. Uh, so a couple of cities' pronunciation this week caught my ear. Mm -hmm. You did get a correction on Traverse. Is that what we came up with? Emphasis I think on it's the first... Travers. Travers. I think it's Travers. I'm the one that keeps fucking this up, by the way. Traverse. Emphasis on the first syllable. <laughs> Traverse <laughs> City. Stick with it, AJ. You've got it. Now, the beautiful submission from an ally in Port Huron is the new correction. It's Huron. Huron. More of a long U sound, as in bulge. Oh, bugle. Bugle. Bulge. <laughs> I'm a little <laughs> dyslexic today, too. Bugle. Yeah. Huron. Yeah. Okay. Like Lake Huron, right? Yeah. Like Lake, yeah. I don't know oh, if blue. I messed that one up. I feel like I would have said Huron, but all right. We're going to keep moving. Our family cottage, built by my dad and grandpa in the early 1950s, is about 40 miles north of that city on Lake Huron and is my happy place. As you have been speaking of dads this week, mine was the best my sister and I could have asked for. Funny, warm, kind, and most of all, patient. He became an amazing grandpa and ended his beautiful life as a loving caregiver to our sweet mom, his wife of 57 years, who had Alzheimer's. Thinking of him always brings a smile to my heart. My pet text features that happy place as a backdrop. Murphy loved the water, but just at the edge. You can guess his breed if you'd like, but it's not too challenging. LOL. There's my dad with babies for you, Dana. Just doing his thing at the cottage. Be well, all Cobeans friends. Look at Oh, Look at that. Tractor with the baby. Cute. His dad. Oh, adorable. Okay. That's a little... That's I a know little, that. That's, that's, that's a, a little, terrier. Yeah. West Thailand terrier? Murphy? Uh, I think it's a Cairn Terrier. I think it's the oh, same Karen as... Oh, Cairn Terrier. That one definitely wants to talk to the manager. 
I think that's the same breed as Toto. You're right. Let's it's see. a Karen Terrier. Karen Terrier. Yay. Oh, thank you for these beautiful memories. I really appreciate that, Anonymous. All right. Next up from Anonymous, pronouns they and them. Hello to the Leguminati and our queens. Thank you for giving me the prompt I needed to write in and send this. This tribute is to my mother, Emma Lou, who recently would have had her 100th birthday had she not died in 2021 on Inauguration Day. I find some comfort that she outlived the orange buffoon's term. She was born in 1923 in rural Indiana. Her parents were both teachers. Her dad became a principal, but was also always a farmer. Her mother died when she was 13, and I know that was a foundational wound, but she loved her dad, and he loved her and always supported her. She went off to college, and she loved it. After graduating, she worked for a short while as a secretary. She hated that job. It just didn't fulfill her. She told her father she was thinking of becoming a nurse, and he said, why not a doctor? So that's what she did. She was one of about six women in her class. She became a pediatric cardiologist. She loved being a doctor. Decades later, she would tell me stories of particular patients, remembering so many details that I knew she cared deeply about each one of them. She married late and had four girls. She had the warmest hands of anyone I've ever known. I always think it must have been so comforting to her patients as it was to me. She took up painting, and I have several of her works in my house. Then later, she took up writing and wrote a memoir and a family history and possibly hundreds of haiku, plus other poems and short stories. I know I'm going on too long, but I've barely scratched the surface. She wasn't perfect, but she was wonderful. She always pushed herself to give us cultural experiences she didn't have growing up. I never realized she was an older mom because she was so active and young-seeming. I love and miss her every day, and I'm including a baby picture. She's the one squinting in the sun. The other baby is her first cousin. I love the... the sentence, she wasn't perfect, but she was wonderful. Me too. Look at these babies. Oh, so sweet. Thank you for that. That's a wonderful submission, Anonymous. It is. And another anonymous person, pronouns she and her. Everyone's staying secret today. Hello, ladies of the beans. I felt inspired by the outpouring of love from AG for her dad on his birthday and wanted to write. I don't know my biological donor, but my dad, Gary, married my mother and adopted me when I was three. He raised me as his own daughter with his last name. Now this amazing man was there for everything in my childhood. Saturday school, music lessons, band practice, all the things that made my childhood good and meaningful have memories of him attached. I remember him loading up and carrying bass drums and other heavy musical equipment when I marched. And one winter, he spent a ton of overtime money to buy me a professional wooden clarinet. Football games, plays and musicals, academic events, overnight bands and school trips, my dad was present for every single one. My dad is still alive, but because I have no contact with my mother, I rarely talk to him, and I have not seen him in person in seven years. I miss him terribly, and hearing A.G. talk about how incredible her dad was and how missed he is after all these years really hit my heart. My dad is a Fox News addict, so he won't ever hear these words, but he deserves all the accolades no matter what. I don't know why that got me really choked up. It's I good in me too. Yeah, I could not have asked for a better dad and he deserves to be lifted up in love. Whew. For pet tax, it's a little man, Lincoln, my six-year-old best friend. He doesn't know how many times he's rescued me during our years together. He might be in love of my life. I'm a lucky girl. Thank you and your entire crew for bringing the news with swearing the way it needs to be brought. The good news segment is one of my favorite news features ever. It's like a spoonful of honey after the bitterness of the cursed news. Thank you both, AG and DG, for being y'all. My God. The world is definitely better and brighter because of you. Anonymous, whoever you are, thank you for bringing the feels to the good news today in such a gorgeous submission. Yeah, what a beautiful, what a beautiful piece of writing. Wow. To all of you. Whew. On on anonymous day. <laughs> I know. Except for Terry, who had her yeah. correction for us at the beginning for salute, which we also appreciate very, Terry's very much. Terry's like, I'm going to own who I'm telling you guys messed <laughs> up. Everyone else is like, I have a story and I don't want to tell you who I am. <laughs> oh, my God. I love this. This was a beautiful submission day. Absolutely. I can't wait to see what we get for tomorrow. So if you have any good news stuff you want to send to us, send it to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Do you have any final thoughts today? I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm just in my feels right now. So I don't. Give us a sign off. I will. I know it's um, you're listening to this on October 5th, but it is October 4th. It is my dad's birthday. And so I just wanted to uh, wish him a happy heavenly birthday. And happy everybody heavenly. will be back in your 
We'll be back in your ears tomorrow. So please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And please take everyone you know with you. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. Hi, I'm Frances Callier. And I'm Angela V. Shelton. And we're Frangela. You know what you need in your life? Hmm. The Final Word Podcast. Yes, you do. That's right. It is the final word on all things political and pop cultural. Where we make real news real funny. Where we inspire you so you can hashtag resist. Subscribe and get a new episode of The Final Word Podcast each week. It's the news we think you need to hear. That's right. We think you need to hear it. Okay? Yeah, it's what we say so. That's right. And because all we do is give, every Thursday you can listen to our hysterical podcast, Idiot of the Week. We round up the stupid because you know what? Somebody has to. Okay. All we do is give. Hi, I'm Harry Lickman, host of Talking Feds a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Fed's favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond. Plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts.